The movie begins with a scene showing the outskirts of the town of Gainesville, Georgia in 1863. It is pouring. The army caravan is moving down the road. A man wearing a black hat and a cloak stands in their way. With a gap-toothed smile, he presents himself as a friend of the Confederacy. They amicably greet each other, and the soldiers ask him to step aside and clear the way. But the man in the hat knows they're bringing the shipment of gold for General Lee, and he will give way not before they give the gold to him. When the soldiers refuse to do that, the man takes out two laser sight equipped Uzi submachine guns and opens fire. In seconds, all guards are wasted and their horses run away in fear. Next, we move to Washington, and it is October 10th, 1994. The meeting of the Senate's Covert Operations Oversight Committee begins. Young politician George Spada enters the room and is greeted by senators awaiting him. They're going to discuss Dr. Hans Kleindast, the Nobel laureate who helped the government with the space program and for the past 20 years has been secretly doing time travel research. Senators are skeptical at first, but George states that Kleindast's work turned out to be a total success. After that, the senators start listening carefully. Spada explains the details and says that one cannot travel to the future as it has not yet been created, but it is possible to go back in time. There is one thing though, changes made in the past may have a catastrophic effect in the present. He explains that it would be extremely dangerous to go into the past and kill Hitler, for example, because future events will change, and this can lead to the fall of mankind. They need to establish a covert agency to police time travel and prevent changes in the timeline, and it will be called the Time Enforcement Commission, or TEC. Its first commander will be Officer Matuzak from Washington, D.C. Police Department. Senators worry about the financial side of the matter and how it will affect the current state of the economy. But George argues that it is not the first priority now because the time interventions have already been made. Ten days ago, the CIA broke up an arms sale to terrorists in Hamburg. What made this different is that the purchase was made with the gold bullion dated 1863 and stamped as the property of the Confederate States of America. It was tested and authenticated. Time travel can give rise to a new type of crime, so they cannot afford to be slow. One of the senators says it sounds like a bullshit Star Wars program to him, but young Senator Aaron McComb doesn't think so and agrees to chair the oversight committee. A beautiful young woman named Melissa Walker stands near the watch boutique at a mall, and a young man comes up to her and says that there's never enough time to satisfy a woman. Melissa replies that you never want to miss an opportunity, turns around, and kisses the young man. This is her husband, Max Walker, the DC Metro police officer. They're walking around the mall, and Max notices how a thief on the roller skates rips out an old lady's purse. Max blocks him the way, raising his foot before the thief's face and says, Read it. Wolverine, between the lines, I should get the f*** out of here. The guy has no choice but to return the purse to the old lady. She smiles and thanks Max. Max looks up and sees two shady-looking men who are watching him closely, but when he turns around again, they are gone. Max joins his wife and they continue walking around the shopping center. Melissa asks if he decided about the new job at the TEC, will there be duty trips, and whether the job is dangerous. Max says jokingly that he doesn't bake cookies for a living anyway. A man with a parrot on his shoulder approaches them and offers to take a photo. Melissa talks Max into taking a photo and says that he will look at it very often. As it turns out later, the girl is totally right about this. It's raining outside, Melissa and Max are making love in their cozy home by candlelight. A thunderstorm arises in the evening. They are lying in bed, and Melissa wants to tell Max something. But she is interrupted by a phone call, which Max just has to answer. At work, his colleague called in sick, and Max has to replace him. He puts on his police uniform, and Melissa is unhappy. She was going to tell him something important. Max tells her to take it easy and just wait for him, promising that they'll talk when he's back. When Max steps outside, he immediately gets hit in the face with a buttstock, and then some thug kicks him down from the porch. Melissa sees all this and screams, but the other thug grabs her hair and drags her back into the house, shutting the door behind him. Two thugs approach Max. These are the men he saw at the mall. They start butchering Max and then shoot him. Max recovers and unzips the shirt. There is a bulletproof vest underneath it. He runs to his wife's screams, but at that moment the house explodes. Max looks at his burning home and realizes that his beloved wife has perished in the fire. Wall Street, 1929. It is the time of the stock market crash, and near a high-riser lies the body of a man who threw himself out of a window. 
a man named Lyle Atwood enters the building. In the office, he takes out a newspaper dated 2004 with a stock market summary. Then he calls a man by the name of Ross and requests him to buy 100,000 shares of a loss-making company called Middle States Oil. He assures Ross that things for the company are going to turn around. At this time, a portal appears in the room, and Max Walker comes out of it. Lyle and Max used to be partners in TEC before Lyle went wrong, and began to use his duty status for his own profit. While they talk, Lyle manages to quietly press the alarm button under the table. Then, two guards come into the room, and one of them is going to beat Max in the old English boxing style. I went ten rounds with John L. Sullivan himself. Max makes short work of him. I saw Tyson beat Sphinx on TV. After being landed a couple of high kicks, the other guard grabs the floor lamp to oppose something to Van Damme's perfect split. But Max dodges the blow in the most stupid but spectacular way. To simply duck is not the Van Damme style, you know. Then Max knocks the guard out by hitting him in the groin. Lyle takes out the gun and starts shooting raggedly, but quickly runs out of ammo. Max tries to figure out who Lyle works for, and it turns out to be Senator McComb, who's going to run for president and needs money for his electoral campaign. Max asks Lyle to testify against the senator, but Lyle refuses, worrying about his family. Walker has no choice but to bring Lyle back to their time. Lyle asks Max to allow him to die here in the past, otherwise the senator will kill all his family. After this, Lyle jumps out the window and Max rushes after him. Having caught him in the air, Max activates his time-traveling device, a portal opens before them, and they disappear. After arriving to his time, Lyle is immediately taken to court where he is accused of time travel with the intent to alter the future. The charges are compounded by his status as a time enforcement officer, but Lyle says nothing in his defense, and he is sentenced to death. The ex-agent is immediately returned to 1929, where he completes his fatal fall, landing on a parked car. Washington, 2004. The work in the TEC headquarters is in full swing. A commission led by Senator McComb enters the headquarters to see how the project funds are spent. TEC employee quickly flips the dartboard with a photo of McComb with darts in his forehead. Aaron McComb sees Walker and says that he's heard a lot about him. Walker says the same, and then McComb asks him to join them as he wants to know more about his last assignment. While they talk, Max reveals that he knows who Lyle worked for, and McComb cynically asks why the man's not been arrested yet. Max answers that it's because the sole witness is dead. The commission is discussing a man named Parker, who developed the unique superconducting chip now utilized by TEC. Senator McComb lost a huge amount of money when he quit working with him right before the patent was obtained. Now Senator wants to shut the TEC project, explaining that it could be disastrous if a man makes contact with a past version of himself. And besides, the danger is presented by rogue agents like Lyle Atwood, who are tempted to stay in the past. That's why Senator McCombs going to do whatever it takes to close the project. In the car, the senator's assistant says they don't have enough funds for the campaign, even with those obtained by traveling to the past. McComb gets angry and hits the assistant's head against the car window, smashing his nose. Then the boss tells him not to state what they can't do, but just name the amount necessary to keep the campaign trail going. Lawrence says they need 50 million bucks. That is what McComb lost because of Agent Walker, and he decides to get rid of him. Max is at his workplace, looking at the photo of McComb when Agent Matuzak comes up to talk to him. He's his boss, but also his good friend. Max learns from him that McComb is a very dangerous man. Max says that Lyle worked for McComb, but he was intimidated and didn't testify, and also that half of the TEC agents are in McComb's pocket. Matuzak states that he is not one of them. Walker wants to investigate and bring McComb out into the open. He looks at the picture taken in the mall. It makes him mad that he can't break the law and go back to save his wife, while this scumbag makes a fortune changing the past. Matuzak warns Max that he'd better have bulletproof evidence, since McComb is a presidential candidate, and asks him to come over for dinner. But Max refuses. At home, Max watches a video of his wife, which he has learned backwards and forwards. Max is sleeping, but suddenly he feels the presence of an enemy. He opens his eyes and manages to dodge the electric shock. The knife fight starts between Max and an Asian looking like Liu Kang. Using a towel, Walker grabs the attacker's hand and manages to subdue him. While Max tries to figure out who sent them, another thug takes the stun gun and points it at Walker. But Max uses the first attacker as a cover. 
Together they fall to the floor, knocking down the water cooler. The water spreads across the floor, and when it reaches the feet of the other thug, Walker jumps onto the kitchen table with his signature split. When the attacker discharges his stun gun, the electric shock strikes him through the water. At this time, TEC agent Fielding appears in Max's house and comes up to see what happened. She was assigned as his new partner to check his integrity. Matazak explains to Max that Fielding will work with him because there are few people left he can trust. Max has no choice but to accept her. They sit in a time-traveling machine equipped with powerful jet engines, buckle up, and go back in time. Partners arrive in 1994. It is Sunday, October 9th, and Fielding says it's her birthday tomorrow. Max warns her not to visit herself in the past, but Fielding would very much like to call herself and ask not to sleep with Bobby Morgan, which was a total disappointment. Max and Fielding are at the scene, near the Parker Macomb Data Link Systems building. Walker loads the gun and enters the building. Fielding comes from the other side and expects a signal from him. Inside the building, Jack Parker and young Macomb talk about their new chip. Macomb says the company is about to get bankrupt and asks Parker to return his money. Parker gives him the check and says he found an investor who has faith in the company. Young Macomb is about to quit the partnership, but at this moment, future Macomb appears from the portal with his henchmen and warns his younger self not to take the check and not to give up the chip which will bring billions of dollars in the future. The old Macomb hits Parker and is about to put a bullet in his head, but Walker shows up and orders him to drop his gun and the return module. But then Fielding puts a gun to Walker's head, as she is the rogue agent working for Macomb. Macomb's henchmen capture Max, and the senator shoots and kills Parker. He's going to do the same to Walker, but Max breaks free and a gunfight starts. The older Macomb tells his younger self that this company is now his own, and gives him an envelope with further guidance on how to run the business. Having dealt with the thugs, Max is going to sort things out with Macomb, but then Fielding gets in his way. Macomb wants to activate the return module, but Fielding asks him not to return without her. Not wanting to take her with him, the dull-witted Macomb shoots her first, giving Walker time to escape. Then he returns to the future. Walker also returns to his time, and he is puzzled by what he sees. Matuzak says he's lucky to be able to come back because the authorities are going to destroy all the time machines. The company that produces the chips is the property of Macomb. He is way ahead in the polls, and almost everyone switched to his side. Walker says Macomb killed Fielding, but Matuzak doesn't know who she is, and there's no information about her in the database. Somehow, Max manages to convince Matuzak that they were friends before Macomb intervened in the past. Matuzak believes him, but does not understand how Macomb managed to travel into the past without them knowing. They find out that the first prototype of the time machine was not destroyed, and with it Macomb would become the only time traveler. Breaking through the security, friends are trying to send Walker back in time. The security officers fire at Matuzak, who's trying to activate the machine. Two guards with no self-love stand right under the nozzle of the jet engine. They shoot Matuzak, but he still manages to reach out and activate the switch. The engine starts and Walker departs to 1994. Walker reads the police report to find out in which hospital Fielding is. He finds her and asks to testify against Macomb. She agrees, but Walker says that the TEC database hasn't got any of her data and never had, which leaves Fielding puzzled because she had training in TEC for six years. They need some proof of Fielding's existence, and Walker goes to the lab to get her blood. In the lab, he finds his wife's blood test, which says she's pregnant. He takes Fielding's blood and returns to the ward, but she's already dead because Macomb's men inject something into her IV line. He rushes to the mall to warn his wife. There he meets young Melissa, but then Macomb's henchmen see them. The 2004 Max and his wife manage to escape, and he tells her about time travel. He urges that he wants to help her, but doesn't say that today she will be killed. That same evening at Walker's house, Melissa goes downstairs and meets the older Max, who asks if she told the young Max that she's pregnant. Melissa replies that he didn't give her the chance, and the older Max asks her to go upstairs and keep the young Max there at all costs. Macomb's men are here. Their task is to kill Walker because if they don't, they'll never be able to return. As before, thugs attack Walker when he steps out of the door. But this time, it is the older Walker. And now he deals with the bandits with ease. Then he's aided by his younger self, who beats the rest of the thugs. 
Two walkers defeat all the Macomb's henchmen, although the last of them, the big guy, still manages to knock the young Max out just before the older Max kills him. The older walker comes up to the room where the 2004 Macomb took Melissa hostage. There's a bomb in the house, and Macomb is ready to blow himself up together with Walker because he knows that his younger self will survive and become president by using his instructions. But the older Max foresaw this and lured the 1994 Macomb to the house, so he suddenly appears behind Walker. Melissa hits Macomb in the groin and breaks free, but Macomb shoots her in the shoulder. Then Max pushes two Macombs together, and because of the paradox, they merge into a writhing bloody mess before disappearing from existence forever. They need to get out because the house is about to blow up. Young Max lies on the lawn, and the older Max takes Melissa out of the house and puts her down next to him. Walker returns to his time and sees that his friend Matuzak is alive and kicking, and he doesn't even remember that firefight with the security. Walker asks him about Senator Macomb and learns that 10 years ago he called off all his appointments and disappeared without a trace. Fielding passes by and Max tells her that Bobby Morgan's still waiting for another chance. Fielding smiles, but she's totally puzzled because she doesn't even know Max. When the criminal senator disappeared, a new timeline emerged. When Max gets to his house, a 10-year-old boy runs to him, calling him dad, and then his wife Melissa greets him with a smile. Just like 10 years ago, she wants to tell him something. Well guys, this was my recap of the movie called Time Cop. I wonder how many people got baited when I called the Tech 9 an Uzi submachine gun. If you enjoy the recap, please leave your like and subscribe to my channel. I also prepared more recaps. You can watch it by clicking on this pictures.